The uh, Who Killed WCW, Episode 1, Dave. What were your thoughts? I don't even know where to start. Um, we got to start somewhere. Um, I mean, I talked about it a lot already, but... Um, okay, so I guess uh, key stuff here. Anything that stuck out? Um... I mean, there's a lot to it. Um, you know, the uh, I mean, it was interesting to see uh, Brad Siegel there, um, you know, talking about how he fought Ted Turner on trying to get the uh, on, on when Ted Turner wanted to get uh, Nitro on or wrestling on TNT because he thought the TNT should be an upscale station. And he thought that wrestling was uh, downscale too Midwestern and too Southern. Um, and, uh, so talked about that, um, you know, they tried to do the thing about how none of the executives at, at Turner wanted wrestling. Um, and I mean, of the top, top guys, that's true, but that's total revisionist history. I mean, there were many, I think we did this part on, uh, when we did the preview. Yeah. There were many executives that were, um, you know, that, uh, were very, um, you know, that followed the wrestling. I mean, you know, Steve Beverly and I talked to different uh, executives there. They subscribed to the newsletter. I mean, um, both newsletters. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that, that uh, the wrestling side hated was the fact that, uh, you know, these guys were, were trying to study and learn the business. They didn't want them to learn the business. They wanted to con them. Um, and, um, but they were, they were interested. They weren't looking at, at killing it. I mean, there were definitely people who, who didn't want it, but the idea that it was nobody but Ted Turner, I mean, of the top three or four guys, Ted Turner was the only one who wanted it. But um, once Hogan came, the whole situation really changed. Before Hogan, it wasn't really, I mean, there were still people that were, um, that were wrestling fans in the organization, but um, after Hogan, a lot of the people that were not wrestling fans kind of got on board, especially when Nitro started getting really hot. It was kind of like, like when they had those Georgia Dome shows that did 35, 40,000 people. Um, I mean, WCW was the darling of a lot of the people there. Uh, when, you know, they lost $60 million, WCW was anything but that um, in, in uh, 2000. Um, but, um, yeah, there was, a, I mean, there's a lot of minor factual mistakes, but they're, they're minor. I mean, I wrote about them for this week's issue. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, I I guess the things that I was interested in seeing is uh, if they would make any mention of Zane Bresloff, which in week one they did not, you know, and he was a key guy as far as a lot of the ideas uh, that, that were out of the box that were used for both promotion and just uh, on the show and just, you know, things for the company. He was not mentioned. Um, and um, there were a couple of other things that I was, uh, I guess we'll wait and see over the next couple of episodes as far as, um, you know, what uh, what is and isn't talked about. Um, you know, at the end, I mean, I think that if you watch the first episode, I mean, it's very heavily Eric Bischoff. Um, and it, by the end, you know, the consensus seems to be that uh, Hulk Hogan was running the company. He was completely selfish. He put himself above everyone. That the, the Hogan Sting match, even even Eric had to, you know, said that it was supposed to be a fast count, and somehow it wasn't a fast count, and kind of said that you know Hogan wasn't down with it, and Hogan had creative control, and um, you know that was the price that they paid for giving him creative control, but he wasn't going to come otherwise, and Hogan was the difference maker. You know, he was the biggest star in the game, and um, he helped them a lot until he hurt them. Um, at the end when Hogan was no longer drawing and everyone's got a shelf life. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, you know, that was, I mean, it was Hogan, it was the company's undoing, it was Eric's undoing. Eric always thought, you know, I mean, remember, I remember the discussion that he and I had, and this was when uh, WWE was ahead. This would probably be late 98, and and he was just that they're a flash in the pan that Steve Austin and the Rock are flashes in the pan and you know when they're you know when the flash in the pan ends it'll be back to us because we got Hogan and where Hogan goes goes the money and I was trying to tell him that everyone's got a shelf life and Hogan's shelf life as the top guy is over 
you know, and uh, people are moving on, you know, it's like, that's just, that's just how the business works. And, um, you know, it's one of the problems with people who never study history is that they make the same mistakes that other people make. So that's, uh, that was one of the big issues there. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the basic thing at the end of the, sh at the end of the first episode was, um, Hogan was selfish and, Hogan, and Eric was his pawn. And even though the whole episode was trying to make Eric look good, that was kind of the conclusion there. And, uh, you know, Bret Hart was very negative on Eric, as I knew he would be. Um, I thought, Co like I said before, I thought Conan and Medusa came off pretty well. Um, Brad Siegel certainly came off as someone who hated wrestling, hated wrestlers, um, thought that they were all pathological liars, which, which back in those days, a good percentage of them were. And, um, you know, so um, they had uh, Dick Cheatham, who was one of the comptrollers, who was kind of one of the guys who was, I guess, uh, you know, talking about how nobody in the company wanted to support the wrestling. And if you, if you were trying to help the wrestling company make money, that it was career suicide, which would be weird because, again, in that programming department, that would tell me that there was a lot of people committing career suicide that I don't believe were committing career, career suicide. So I don't really, um, you know, again, like there were, you know, again, there were a lot of people who, who didn't want, especially in the early years, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't want it. And then everyone got on the bandwagon and then they got off the bandwagon when the thing was losing money and it was going downhill. And, uh, you know, that was basically that. My presumption is that uh, the next episode is going to be uh, pushing the idea that uh, I guess maybe Kevin Nash killed WCW, and then the third episode, Vince Russo, and then the fourth episode, Jamie Kellner, be my guess. I don't know. Because I would uh, presume, I mean, at the beginning of the episode, the whole thing is, you know, a lot of people killed WCW. So yeah, I think that's probably that, that's the conclusion they're going to come to with each episode focusing on one person who may have been responsible um kevin sullivan said that it was a death of a thousand swords and, and eric bischoff kind of said that too you know in, in in the sense that there was you know a lot of things they didn't it didn't seem in any of the previews like kevin nash was going to get a lot of the blame um i mean there were no hints of anyone speaking badly about nash um kellner's name never came up in the first episode at all and, um, you know, um, yeah, Vince Russo, Bill Goldberg said that Vince Russo killed WCW and Vince Russo was appalled and, and Vince Russo didn't kill WCW. Vince Russo just didn't help WCW. He was a, a strong negative, strong negative. Um, but it was, you know, a lot of the damage was done before him and, and he did a lot of damage too, but I could never, I could never say he was the number one culprit, but, but he was a failure in his role, a big, big time failure. Um, so, you know, he was brought in to turn it around and no matter what he says, he didn't turn it around, you know? Um, I mean, by the time his, his left first, it worse, far worse, far worse. Yeah. And his, his booking made no sense. They, you know, they just had no, um, they had no conception of their audience. I've never seen a promotion with so little conception of their audience. I don't know if, I mean, a lot of promoters, I would even say most of the promoters um, looked very down on their fan base. I mean, the ones who didn't were the exceptions. They were not the the rule um, in territorial days. I mean, my God, I mean, the, you know, Roy Shire had, you know, who was very successful here. He had nothing but disdain for wrestling fans. I mean, the, just, you know, and, and, and a lot of them did. Even the ones who gave it lip service, they really disdained the fans. They, you know, called them marks and, you know, things like that. You know, I mean, the only ones... I mean, Bosch, I would say, would be an exception. Um, Mushnick was Mushnick was an exception. I mean, Mush, you know, those were the ones who those were the the promoters that banned that word. Vince McMahon banned that word too. Um, but I don't think Vince McMahon had any respect for his audience, at least early on. You know, I think that the promoters now have. Um, I mean, I don't want to say respect for their audience, but they don't have the disdainment of the audience. Um, I think that they, especially now, I think they understand how important the audience is. Um, 
the pandemic really opened a lot of eyes, you know, you know, of, of people of, about how important the audience in wrestling is. But, you know, those old promoters never lived through that. So they just had they just thought that they were catering to a bunch of inbreds and and uh, ran their businesses accordingly with 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 a few notable exceptions. So, um, you know, but I don't think I never had the impression the people in WCW had any any um, respect for their audience. But they were also like, I've seen a lot of, you know, people go down in wrestling um, because they had no respect for the audience and treated them, you know, like with no respect and the audience stopped coming. And so they got what they deserved. But WCW was probably the worst example of, of almost all of them. Maybe some of the promotions that did uh, the Invisible Man and, and uh, the Bionic Man and things like that were probably worse. But um, we had an Invisible Man in WCW. Yeah. We had Hogan and Warrior and the Magic Mirror and the Teleportation. Um, yeah, I mean, we did have the the the, man, the Magic Mirror stuff. Yeah, yes, that was that was pretty embarrassing. It was stupid. There's a lot of stupidity there. A lot of stupidity there. You know, running people off roads and a lot of like I just remember watching that thing every week and watching the numbers go lower every week and you know just you know you you know and the attendance figures go lower. I mean, look, you could say the same thing about AEW, but it, I mean. It didn't drop like WCW did. I mean, WCW, you look at those year-on-year -year drops, man, from uh, 98 to 99 to 2000. They were, they were brutal. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notify button, and you'll never miss a video again.